after the Battle of Fort Duquesne, where the English got surprised by the French and Indians that were hiding, you know, behind trees and rocks and digging trenches and really fighting Indian style, which was, you know, the way that war was going to be fought in in America. There, there, it wasn't going to be like in Europe where it was more of a, I guess you could say, chess match between kings than anything where you just send all your troops out there and you fight mano y mano across a field in the last man standing <clears throat> that's the side that wins it's going to be completely different and it took um a prime minister like william pitt who took over as prime minister in england to understand that he becomes known as the organizer of victory when he commits to to the war in america the seven years the seven years war french and indian war is also called the seven years war and remember it is a world war uh, his commitment to the war effort is what allowed them to win. It did, and it didn't take much because the English, the uh, sorry, the American settlers just outnumbered the French by so much. So it was a matter of sending over the right troops, and he he really did concentrate on the war effort in America. And once he did that, the tide turned. Um, so William Pitt is given a lot of credit for that. In fact. Um, they sent a group in to uh, go and take Fort Duquesne. By the time they got to Fort Duquesne, the French knew that they were going to lose it, so they set it on fire, and then when they got there, it had already been burned down. So they built another fort in its place and named it after William Pitt, called it Fort Pitt, and that is where Pittsburgh is today. So Pittsburgh comes from uh, William Pitt also. The final battle in the French and Indian War was a battle that happened up in Quebec. Um, the, the, uh, obviously, that's the French capital and the English and settler and the English and the, the uh, colonists knew that in order to win this war, they're going to have to go at the heart of the French territory up in Quebec. So they traveled up there and uh, made numerous attempts to attack the capital at Quebec. Quebec is very fortified, as you can see in this painting right here. You've got um, up above the rocks in Quebec is what they call the Plains of Abraham, and that's where the French castle, the capital and their castle was, and uh, there was an epic battle that occurred up there, but it took weeks and weeks to find a weakness in the defense of the French who, who would uh, have troops all along the river there, and the English, you could see, obviously, in the red coats, uh, did find a weakness in their the defense of the French, but it, they had to drift down river down the, the river right there that they're on is called the St. Lawrence River, and it comes all the way from the Atlantic Ocean inland to Quebec, and they uh, let themselves drift down river and then found a weakness in the defense and then came up and surrounded the castle, and as as I said, a big epic battle occurred there, where uh, the two generals were both shot and killed. Uh, General Montcalm from the French and General James Wolfe for the English. However, in the end, the English are able to win that Battle of Quebec and win the French and Indian War. So with the, the uh, winning of the French and Indian War, the territory that English won was substantial. You see all that ye yellow right there <clears throat> in that map. Now remember, if you go back to some of my earlier maps, you remember how how vast the uh, French territory was. Think back on the map that I showed earlier with the green going all the way to the Rocky Mountains. Well, you'll notice here that uh, all that green now, that used to, what used to be green in French territory no longer is French territory. You see, interestingly enough, Spain, who decided that they were going to side with the French in this war and as a reward for siding with the French. They didn't fight much, but they sided with them and they potentially could have fought if the war went on longer. But as a reward, the French handed over uh, all the territory from the Mississippi River all the way to the Rocky Mountains, said, gave it to Spain, said, this is yours. So that did not, it was not part of the Treaty of Paris of 1763. The Treaty of Paris of 1763 ends the French and Indian War and the uh, French gave up all territory up in Canada, all the way to the Mississippi River, and even 
even down uh, to, you know, um, close to where, um, excuse me, as close to where Florida was. And you could see now that Florida is in the hands, at least temporarily, of England because of uh, an agreement that was made with the Spanish. The, the Americans told the Spanish, we'll allow you to keep the territory from the Mississippi River all the way to the Rocky Mountains as long as you give us Florida. So it was a big negotiated deal by three co countries, by England, by Fran defeated France, and by defeated Spain, who was allowed to keep that territory. The, the Americans weren't that interested in the territory from the Mississippi River all the way to the Rocky Mountains, at least not yet. That will come later in what's called the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what it looked like. Um, it was a big victory for the English and the colonists. Uh, but some things came out of this war. And one of them was that the colonists felt confident. They experienced war and they were successful. And this is a big one right here. The myth of British invincibility had been shattered due to uh, the Battle of Fort Duquesne. And what I mean by that is the colonists had always envisioned the Redcoats as being the end all be all when it came to soldiers, that they were the best, they were the bravest, and no one could defeat them. I mean, they're, they're British subjects, the colonists are, and they, they're, their heroes are the Redcoats. And when they saw the Redcoats run from the battlefield at the Battle of Fort Duquesne, when they were attacked by the French and the Indians, they went, whoa, what the heck is that? And they really were shocked by that. And in fact, it ends up giving them some confidence later on and in their minds, that myth of invincibility, British invincibility, is gone. And later on, when they are going, 11 years down the road, when the revolution starts, they're going to conjure up images in their head of what happened at that battle. And it's going to give them confidence that, you know, that, that the Redcoats can be defeated. The Americans are beginning to believe that they're equal with the Redcoats. And war was unifying for the colonists. And it, and it became apparent that the Amer is a, um, Americans are a people of destiny that why should we allow this country 3,000 miles away that's nothing more than a small island? Why should we let them control all this territory? We should go for our freedom and independence. More and more people are beginning to think along those lines. And the other thing was, too, is with the removal of the French out west, the French menace the, is gone. So again, remember I told you that in the minds of the colonists, their number one opponent, enemy, was the French. That was their biggest threat in their minds. Now we know that their biggest threat was the Native Americans. They were an even bigger threat than the, than the French because of sheer numbers. But again, the colonists don't know about the numbers. They, all they know is the rivalry between England and France, is, and they've been taught forever that the French are bad. So without the French out there, the colonists are beginning to believe, do we even need the English anymore? So this is all movement towards revolution. Now, out west, the uh, French just didn't automatically leave really quickly. In fact, they wanted to stay in their forts. So they're way to allow themselves to stay there would be to arm the Indians out there and tell them that the, Ameri the American colonists are going to be coming over the Appalachian Mountains and they're going to take your land. And anytime you see an American, kill them. So uh, the, an Ottawa chief named Pontiac, uh, yes, the car manufacturer, Pontiac is, is named after him, uh, started attacking Americans, Pontiac's Rebellion, it was called. Americans, as they went over the Appalachian Mountains to settle in these areas, were constantly being attacked by Pontiac's Ottawa uh, Indian tribe, as well as other Huron Indian tribes that were attacking them. And they're going to find out that, I mean, they're being, they're being shot by Native Americans who are firing French weapons. So they, the colonists are, are concerned, and they tell England, look, we need you to send redcoats to protect us from the French because the French are giving the Indians weapons and they're staying out there and they won't get out of their forts like they said they were going to get out of their forts and all that. They, it's not happening. 
So there's concern amongst Americans and they're voicing that concern to England and England sitting there 3000 miles away going, we don't have any money. England had, was almost broke after the French and Indian war. They spent a lot of money on that as well as wars against France that are happening in Europe. And uh, they didn't have any money. So they told the Americans, look, we can't do anything about this. You're going to have to do it yourselves. And in order to discourage Americans from moving out West, they passed a law called the a proclamation of 1763. The proclamation of 1763 was a, a, a drawn imaginary line at the very top of the Appalachian mountains that, that go all the way down. So if you look at this map right here, you see that line, black line, all the way from up in Maine, all the way down to Florida. And it's an imaginary line. And it basically said that no colonists could go past that line. You can't go out West. If you do, um, and we find out we're going to put you in jail, we're going to lock you up. It, it was, a law that was passed to protect them from Pontiac's rebellion. But the Americans took it as, excuse me, you're going to tell us where we can and can't go, where we can and can't settle. They were upset with that. Again, here's some foreshadowing of what's going to happen. This is the beginning. It's really not the beginning because it happened. It's happened before this animate, this uh, animosity toward England. The, Proclamation of 1763 united the colonists and they were upset. Just a case in point. Here's an example. Here's information for you. If you ever want to talk about in an essay, the proclamation of 1763 that helped bring on anger directed at England, there's evidence in 1765 an estimated 1,000 wagons rolled through the town of Salisbury, North Carolina on their way up west to find the line in defiance of the proclamation. Now think about in your mind what a thousand wagons look like. I, I mean, it, that's, that's a substantial amount and that's a, a definitely a show of force against England. They're saying, hey, we're going to do what we want to do. A thousand wagons went across the, line, the proclamation line. So you could see that this is creating a lot of anger directed at the mother country and you know it's coming. Right, we're going to be talking here in the next chapter about the up and coming revolution. So that is the end of chapter six.